So first of all, to begin, I'd like to wish you all Tashi today. And so today, on the second day, as I mentioned yesterday, I'll give a brief account of the life of the life and liberation of Kampopa. So I probably can't get through the entire life and liberation of Gampopa. So I'll probably have to go through the end of it tomorrow. However, since we do have some time, I think there's no uh, there's no problem. So there's an old Tibetan saying. If you don't know the history of your grandparents, you don't know where the children came from, it says. And so, as it says in this saying, if we don't know our, the history of our gurus and of our lineage, whether we're talking about our whether a lineage or someone who's upholding lineage, it's a, pro, uh, it's a danger that we will have no source or authority for ourselves. And so I think it's important for us to understand, to know these stories of the great masters of the path. So generally, when we talk about history or stories, it's like a, it's like a big mirror in which we can see reflections that are like ourselves, but not only that. But we can also see things that we need to think about and things that we can take as examples for ourselves. For example, with the life and liberation of Gampopa, how is it that we ourselves can achieve the qualities of the Buddha? And so, so that they're not just a, a view, or but an aspiration, but something how we can actually practice it in a, a real human life. And it's like an example that gives us guidance. And so what gives us that in, 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 in actuality are the life stories. So for that reason, in the Tibetan, we don't call the life stories of gurus histories, we call them liberation stories. And so the, the reason is that if the, the life stories of the liberation stories of the, uh, of the great masters, if the, if, if they were only become a research topic or the, the topic for our conference, that would be a real, a real loss. So these are so these uh, we have to have the they need to be something that we need to bring that we followers need to bring to our practice and we have to have the idea that we should do this and the steadfast courage that we should do this is extremely important. So generally, with with Kampopa, there are, there are over forty uh, stories of his life and liberation. Now the main ones are the if we once uh, if we take the ones written by his direct disciples as our basis, then we can have more confidence and trust in them. I believe. Now, among all the stories of life and liberation written by his direct disciples, the ones that are the ones that are known that are best written are the written by. Uh, uh, Jay Padma Drupa, it's a life story in verse, uh, in, as in the form of a praise. And so that is one well-known one. There's another one. There's a life of Gampapa taught in the dialogues, so written down by Jay Dism Kyampa. Also one's by Lo Laya Chang Chung And there's also one by Jay Baram. And so it is very important for us to just read these and to study these stories. Now, Lord Gampapa, though with his date of birth, when was that? In Palmadrupa's uh, uh, praise, uh, praise of his liberation story, it says, from his birth in the female ship here until he went to the place of emanation, it says. So as this says, so this means in the 11th century, it was in the 11th century. 
So he was born in uh, 1079 in the region of Niel. This is in Tibet. And so this is in the uh, district of Hokma city district of Flunze. And so that's where he was born or when he was born. Now, when he was young, he was known by the names of Dharma Drop. And in some of them, he was called Dharma Kyap, according to some of the stories. So he probably had a couple of different names when he was a child. And from the age of five, he began to learn how to read and write. And so when he reached the age of seven, because his father and grandfathers were were doctors, the, they were, his, his, his family was a medical family. And so at the age of seven, he began to study medicine from his father. And so he studied uh, the healing arts, studying medicine. Uh, so one thing we need to understand at this uh, here is that there, there are many well-known names for uh, uh, Gampopa. And so there's so another name for Gampopa was Dapaflaje. So Haje means so what Haje means is means doctor. As so we say doctor in English, so it means a physician. It's like a, an honorific term for physician. In my own home region, even today, we don't call doctors anything but Haje. We don't call them doctors or physicians. We probably don't call them this at all. There's no, no custom of calling them that. Likewise, uh, Gampopa was prophesied by the Buddha, and in these prophecies he was called the picture, uh, the picture physician, right? So in fact, the picture physician should be understood to mean uh, Dapalhaje. So there's the name Dapalhaje. And this is uh, an important name for Gampopa. So basically, uh, from his childhood onward, Gampopa studied medicine. And he had about 13, 13 different teachers. And he came to the, to the he reached the, uh, the, the culmination of his studies and became a, a very skilled physician. Not only that, there are also well-known uh, medical students, including Dapo Menakpa, who were his students. And so there is, so it is said that that Kampopa himself wrote a medical treatise called "A Summary of the Eight Branches." It's, it's said that there is there, but but this uh, text is no longer extant. We we can't get it. It's. But there is still a text called the Shorter Text of uh, uh, Dakpa. So the person who compiled this collection was uh, the doctor Menakpa. And it primarily contains the, the Gampapa's writings about uh, medicine, as well as his instructions on medicine, notes on his instructions on med medicine. And this uh, Shorter Text of Gampapa. Uh, seems to have been written before the the Four Tantras, which is the most well uh, well known text of Tibetan medicine. So it's an important text for the research topic, or something important to study in terms of Tibetan medicine. It's also said that that he uh, there are many important or well known treatments of Tibetan medical practice. That are such as the Dakpo instructions on Pomen, the 15 Dakpo medicines, the Lung medicine, Songtal 25, and so forth. They pa were passed down from Kampopa, it is said. Hence, likewise, there's also the Four Tantras, which is the 
which is like the, the, the fundamental text of Tibetan medicine. And some people say that it's the words of the Buddha, some say it is a, a, a treatise, some say it is a terma. There are different ways, but if we talk about it in terms of it being a terma, uh, the, the, the revealer was uh, Dapa Tetan, uh, Dapa Ngunshe. And, the, and he uh, revealed it in Dakpo. And so in terms of the lineage transmission of that, so Dakpo in particular, Gampopo was also uh, included in that lineage. And so for this reason, uh, Gampopo, in terms of the lineage of the four tantras, the, the uh, great Tibetan text, he also had an influence on its spread. Even that also, before he be went forth and became a monk, uh, from Bari Lotsa and Sanka Lotsa, he received secret mantra te dharma teachings on chakra samvara and so forth, according to some histories. And when he reached the age of 16, his two parents insisted, you have to get married. And they really insisted that he has to get married. And so he married the daughter of Chim Jose. So he married her and they, and they lived together. So, so at that time, his primary work was was uh, caring for patients, giving uh, dispensing medicine to patients, basically doing medical work. But sometimes he also did farm work, including uh, plowing fields and such. Now, he had two children, a son and a daughter. And so they all lived as a very happy family life together. But one year, uh, there was a smallpox epidemic. And so when the smallpox appeared, it was like a, a, an epidemic. So smallpox is a type, of, a type of illness, right? So there's that epidemic. And so first his son, who had reached the age of eight, died. So first the son, and then later, then his three-year-old daughter also died. So when he was bringing the daughter's daughter to the charnel ground, and then came back, his wife had also fallen ill. And no matter what medical treatments he gave her, it didn't help, and she was on the verge of dying. But, but she was still unable to, unable to let go, unable to stop breathing. She's unable to die, unable to get better. It's a very difficult situation. So at that point, so Doc Bodhan Pacheco Gampopa said, said, thought to himself, she's got something that she's, she's not letting go of. What could it be? And so he said the way. So what are you attached to? What can't you let go of? And so tell me, he said. And his wife said, well, what I can't let go of is you. I can't let go of you. I worry that after you die, you're going to live with another woman. That's what I'm worried about. So, so when she said that, Tapa Rinpoche said, you don't need to worry about that at all. From the very beginning, I've wanted to become a monk. And if you die, then I don't want to do anything other than become a monk. I don't want to do anything other than practice dharma. Not only did he say this, in order that his wife would feel comfortable, he, he took, a, took a strong oath uh, that he would not remarry and instead would go off and practice dharma. And then after his wife died, he gave away almost all of their household possessions and money and made sansa reliquaries of his wife's bones and built a stupa. And that stupa is called the remains of the lady stupa. And even now in that day, uh, it's there. You can see the, the, uh, the ruins of that stupa. In. Then he met a Kadampa monk named uh, Gondon Pasar. So, so he and Gondon Pasar 
They became friends and they went to Dapo together. And then in Dapo, there was a lama named Mario Lero Shirap, he was who acted as the Kempo. There was a Geshe Jeshu Semba who was the Acharya. And so at the age of 26, when he had reached the age of 26, so this was in 1113 in terms of the Western calendar, and he took the complete ordination at once. And what that means is that, is that on one day he took the vows of going forth and the novice and the bhikshu all on the same day, on the same time, on the same day. So that's what we called complete ordination at once. In the Tibetan tradition, when someone becomes a monk or a nun, then at that time, we recognize it as like beginning in a human life. And so they give up their old lay name and the and the guru or the kempo who gives them the vows then gives them a new name. So Kampopo was given a new monastic name, and that was Sonam Rinchen. So it's called Sonam Rinchen. So at that time, his friend Gong Tun, you right? as, I, as I mentioned, there was his friend Gong Tun. And Gong Tun said to Gang Popa, he had an idea. The, 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 the Acharya, Chanchi Sampa, who was your Acharya when he took, took the vows, he said there's a Guru Milarepa who has really exceptional instructions. So Milarepa is a Siddha. So let's see if you can get this. Uh, you got to see if you can get the uh, uh, that Siddha's instructions. And so Gampapa said, oh, "We don't have any offerings that we can make in order to uh, give the uh, the teaching. So I don't know if he's going to give us any teachings." So Gondon, so Gondon is someone who always had a lot of ideas. I said, oh, "Don't worry about. Don't worry about that. Just go and ask. Everybody ask." And when he's giving some instructions to someone else, maybe he'll give them to you too. And so he shared that 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 uh, that image. So, so the Gumba, Gumba asked Geshe Sempa said, "Please give me instructions on meditation." And when he received, and when he asked him that, then the Geshe gave him the teachings. And he, Gampapa followed the instructions, and and within seven days he developed good experiences with shot of meditation. So it was after seven days after beginning to meditate, had good experiences. Body and mind were very very comfortable and very clear. He had he had these experiences of bliss and clarity. That was so like so, so much that he was unable to, didn't know the day or night. His mind is so clear, his body was so clear, light, so it hardly knew whether it was day or night. And so, so Chandra Sempa said, I've had these experiences, he said to his master, uh, Chandra Sempa, so is this, a, have I really developed meditation? And so Chandra Sempa said, oh yeah, you've, you've uh, developed meditation. So at that time, so, so he, was, oh, he stayed with his friend Gong Tun. So Gong Tun said to him, something. he looked at him and said, uh, something, something different about him. And he looked a little different. And when he saw that, Gong Tun said, uh, something's happened to you. Something happened to you. So please tell me what happened. Please tell me what you did. And so that's what he said. And when Gong Tun said that, then Gong Papa said, oh, I've developed meditation. I've had such meditation with and he and explained how he developed meditation and Gong Tun, his friend there, and infant got kind of uh, excited about that. And I said, okay, I'm also going to do meditation. I'm going to meditate. And if I don't develop meditation, either I'm going to develop meditation or I'm, I'm going to die on this very bed. So 
and he probably asked uh, Gampopo for instructions on the medicine when he did the meditation. He also developed a really strong experiences of resting and meditation. And one of the things he was so excited about this that he wrote on his be- on his bed. Uh, I going to an exhausted samsara here today, and he wrote this on letters. <laughs> so there's that story about that. The name. And I said, during that time, Gampopo's meditation got better and better, it got clearer and clearer, until he was able to meditate for as long as he wished. Like for five or six or seven days, he could, he would be distracted by the appearances of samadhi, so distracted that he'd forget to eat for like five or six or seven days. It's because of the pleasure of somebody, the bliss of somebody who's distracted that he forgot to even eat food. And the the uh, afflictions never uh, stopped arising manifestly, and they're like they'd been suppressed. And so, but he had no pleasure, for, he had the pleasure of samadhi, but he didn't feel any pleasure from form, sound, or scent, or so forth. So at that time, so one day he was uh, checking to see, how long can I do? How, how many days can I meditate? He said, and, was into the, and so he was able to meditate con- continually, not without stopping for 13 days. So that's uh, something that Gampapa said. So when Gampapa was 28, he thought to himself, oh, my meditation's got really good. But it said that the Kadampas are, are uh, it said that they're well versed in the instructions where they, they really have good instructions on the conduct of a Bodhisattva, and I should study that. And he and Gongtun went together. So his friend Gongtun and he, right? They went down to central Tibet in U. And they went to the area of Chang, when, which is a Pendo Sundrut song in uh, uh, these days. So Pempo, as I mentioned the other day, it's, a, it's like the source of the Katampa teachings. All of the most famous Katampa Geshe's lived there. That's where they all, uh, where all they came to there. And so first, Kadampa met the Kadampa uh, Kadampa uh, Geshe Nyugrumpa. So he was uh, one of the students, the three great students, a student of Chengawa. And his, and his actual name was Tsundrubar, but but the name place he stayed was called Nyugrum. And so he was, and so because he lived at Nyugrum, he was called Nyugrumpa. So that's what people called him. And so from Cheng, uh, so he requested from Gampo requested from Nirumpa the stage teaching on the Kadampa stages of the path, and in particular relative bodhicitta. And when he received the teachings on relative bodhicitta, from that time on, for the entire rest of his life, he was never without uh, bodhicitta. He said. So from that time onward. For the rest of his life, he practiced uh, bodhicitta. And so from that time on, he went to, he went to uh, Gyachariwa, a student of uh, Geshe Langtamba. He received from many instructions of, from a teacher, including Hayat Guru and Vajrapana, and secret mantra teachings. In particular, he had the empowerment of Gumpu Dukku. And now the day after, the night after he'd taken that, uh, the, he saw, he saw, uh, he had a vision of seeing Kumpo. And uh, Gyacharya was said, also had, also had very good dreams. And he said to them, after I gave you the empowerment, on that night, I had some really good dreams. And they're like signs and uh, signs and indications that my own misdeeds have been purified. So I think your being and your realization are at a higher level than mine, he said. So at that time, Langtamba was a student of Potowa. 
Langshar in the Nimbus. Langshar Langshar So Langshar and Sharawa were the two main students of Potoa. And among them, Langri Tampa. Was the, he was the author of the uh, eight verses on training the mind that we all know and practice. And so Geshe Langdan Tampa only practiced uh, Bodhicitta, or primarily practiced that. And so when, uh, when Kampopo was staying with him, he was uh, around the Langtung, uh, in the area around the Longtong Monastery. All the birds and all the other animals, none of them ever uh, harmed one another. On the day that Long Longer Tampa, uh, an old woman came to another from the place. Uh, an old woman from the other place came to that to that place, and she arrived there, and she thought. Oh, uh, Long Tampa has probably passed away, she thought. She didn't know. She hadn't heard it. She had just, she had just arrived. And she looked at him. Ah, Long Tampa must have passed away, because when I get here, when I get here, when I came here on the word, I saw, saw, um, uh, I saw animals killing with each other. I never saw that before. No, I saw that. So Long Tampa probably passed away, she said. And so he was... She must have been a great bodhisattva. Gyacharyuwa was one of his students. Now, there are some really good stories about Gyacharyuwa, but, but today I don't need to tell you. Maybe I'll tell you tomorrow. Gyacharyuwa was, was one of the students of... There's a really good story about Gyacharyuwa uh, when he was a student of long term. So maybe I'll tell, maybe I'll tell you that tomorrow. So, so over the course of several, a few years, he sp uh, Kampapa spent many time in Kadamba monasteries, and so he was living with many different people, and because that was the condition, so his previous meditation actually de deteriorated. So it's like. His meditation, not only did his meditation not um, not get better, it got worse. And so he began to really worry about that. And because he got worried about that, there was a Geshe Gya Yunda, who was uh, primarily, who was primarily a practice meditation. And he started, so we went and asked him about the meditations. Um, uh, so, uh, so he went to uh, Gya Yunda. So Gyayunda primarily taught in the stages of the path and how to meditate on these and gave him the instructions on this. And so when Gampapa meditated, and so it's like he was able to restore his meditation, his uh, meditation improved. Still, <laughs> but the meditation that he was doing at that time was primarily impermanence and the defects of samsara, the, the meditation of the stages of path. And since he was only meditating on those, because of that, he began to feel a real sense of urgency and his mind was filled with a wish for emancipation and world worlds. So his earlier experiences of bliss and of clarity decreased somewhat. So, it's, uh, so, so that is how it happened. So in any case, he stu studied with many different gurus. And when he was thinking about this, well, there are many different ways to practice the Dharma, but among them, the meditation practice is the most important. And so, it made the resolve to only engage in meditation practice. And he went to his homeland. And on the way to his uh, to his homeland, he said uh, he went to the Geshe Deva, the uh, was uh, and received the instructions on White Tara. So when the when you do the White Tara practice, that from the Atisha practice, this 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 the the lineage comes from 
uh, that comes uh, originates from Geshe Drepa. So then he went to his homeland, and when he went to his homeland, there was the ruins of his uh, parents' house. So he built a retreat house, a re retreat cabin there, and he and he stayed there during meditation. And so, and so his previous previously he'd had experiences of bliss and clarity that had decreased. That diminished or deteriorated, and so they then kind of uh, were restored, and his meditation got better and better. And so, in his dreams, he also saw the signs of achieving the tenth bodhisattva level that are explained in the Light of Gold Sutra and the Sutra and the Ten Levels and so forth. And we had so many different dreams. I Kampo thought to himself, "I haven't achieved the levels, but." So why am I having all these dreams? Are the dreams from just a mental confusion, or are they like emanations of ghosts? Or so you begin to worry about this. So there are so many different signs. And so there are many such uh, different signs and indications in his dreams. Now, one most important thing there, the most really important question that which is studied with many different gurus, but so 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 when did he start to follow guru? Where is Milarepa? So how did Gampopa uh, uh, follow or uh, follow Milarepa? So how do, this is important. So if we ask, how did this come about? So generally, Gampopa. Had had heard about the uh, heard the name of Milarep in his deeds, and so he had faith for him. But but the condition that made it so feel like he really absolutely had to go see uh, uh, see see Milarepa was the story of the of the three beggars. So so what happened is that. Gampopa had gone to his uh, to his homeland. He was doing practice, and he did spend a long time doing practice. So one day, the place that he was practicing was probably had a, was probably in Chak in Chakri, and so there's a place called. Um, so he went off to go for one day. He took, went to take a take a rest, and so he went for a walk. And there was a place where there were three three beggars got together. So the the begs they were killing killing the lice like you know when you never buy, wash of course you get a lot of lice so, so they're killing the lice and they're uh, complaining and they're always talking and commiserating with each other and he saw these beggars then among them there was one of them the first beggar said well, what he said was ah oh, we have no merit at all just well if if we had merit. And then we would have to, without needing to look for it, we'd get some sort of big, a nice piece of sampa dough and some nice uh, soup. There'd be nothing better than that. So wouldn't it be wonderful if that happened? And then the second beggar said, ah, no point to any of that. Just, that's just like making ass for sure. What point of that? What's better than that? So we need to be born as the son of the... The, the lord of Narad City. So this is the king of Tur, Narad City. So this is like, and so, you know, so there's no longer an emperor, but there's still the reason. So at that point, there's a Narad City. Uh, and so that's, uh, we have to go see. So we, so we have to be born in that family, is what they're saying. And the third son, ah, what's so good about being Tzede? He's going to have to die someday. What would be better than that? What we really need to hope for is Milarepa. Milarepa doesn't even need to wear any clothes. It's said that the Dakinis bring him the food. He has no fear of birth or death. If something had just happened to me, then if I became like that, then that would be great, wouldn't it? That would be wonderful. So this beggar said that. And Gampopa. Listen to 
listen to the conversation that they're having. And when they started speaking about Milarepa, and he heard that, he immediately he got goosebumps, and it's like he started to cry, shedding tears. That Milarepa, I have to go. If I don't go see Milarepa in this lifetime, just wouldn't be right. I just so this really strong feeling or strong longing that he had to do this. And so as he did this, and so he went to the to the beggars and said, "Said this uh, the city of the Tsar? Where is he? How?" How can I go and see this uh, this Siddha when he asked him this? One beggar said, hey, "Milarepa is probably is probably in the mountains in uh, Tindanyana." And so, it's, uh, so he gave that to Kampopa said, "No, oh, so if that's the case, so please take me there." Is it okay if you take me there? And the beggar said, huh? no, you're young. You're so young. We would, we would be able to keep up with you. And so you go alone. So you go alone. And when you get to Latu, when you get to Latu, you'll hear where he's been because, because he's so well known. So just ask someone and then you'll learn where he is. And so that's what happened. And so when that happened, Gampopo was like really, really happy, really delighted. And he gave the three, the, the three beggars like really as much food as they could eat. He gave them as many presents as they could and said, and so the next day he thought, I oh, need to speak to them again to the next day. But the next day it's like they had disappeared. Who knows where they'd gone? No one knew where they'd gone, and so Kampopa said, Oh, those three beggars are probably Milarepa's uh, emanations. They're either messengers or messengers or uh, emanations. They're not just ordinary people. And so he uh, seemed to say this. So this is the primary condition for him uh, to meet Milarepa's this uh, this conversation with the three beggars. So from tomorrow, I'll speak about how he met Milarepa. And how Gampapa did meditation practice and realized the nature of the Dharmata or the, the nature of the things. So, how he went to Dala Gampo and, uh, and nurtured a gather, uh, an assembly of students, and also how he passed into Nirvana. So, I'll tell that tomorrow. There's still a little bit of uh, time tomorrow, but if I it's probably better to do it that way. Otherwise, yesterday I got a little bit tired. <laughs> Working really hard yesterday. As I got worked too hard, and the old the old teacher got got a bit tired. So uh, better for me to probably better for me to rest a little bit first. <laughs>